Hello and welcome to the first presentation in the Oklahoma State Historic Preservation Office's Everyday Oklahoma Fascinating Stories and Familiar Places series and its presentation All Black Towns in Oklahoma. Our first presenters are Corey Van Hamert and Jenya Green, both of Stantec, and they will be discussing the All Black Town survey they are completing through a contract with the State Historic Preservation Office. Corey and Jenya are both architectural historians and cultural resources management consultants who have been involved in both phases of the All Black Town survey. Funding for the survey is being provided by a grant from the Underrepresented Communities Grant Program from the National Park Service. Over to you guys. Thanks, Shay. Um, as Shay mentioned, I'm Corbin Hamer. My colleague Jenny Green is here also, and we'll talk about the historic all black towns of Oklahoma. Um, so the towns that we surveyed um, are Brooksville, Clearview, Grayson, IXL, Langston, Lima, Redbird, Rentiesville, Summit, Taft, Tatum, Tallahassee, and Vernon. These are 13 of the 14 all black towns in Oklahoma that were surveyed in phase one of this project. Um, phase two, which is going on right now, um, will be talked about later in the presentation. Um, for phase one, we surveyed, we were doing field work between May and June of 2022, and all survey work was conducted by myself and Jenya. We completed preliminary research to identify locations of historic age resources constructed in or before 1977 in each town. Then we conducted field investigations to document previously and newly identified historic age resources within each town's survey boundary. Um, and then all resources that were constructed prior to 1977 were recorded on survey forms, Oklahoma's Historic Preservation Resource Identification Forms, or HPRIs. And then we developed a historic context to evaluate the historic significance of those resources and identify properties for potential nomination to the National Register of Historic Places. Um, as an overview of all black towns of Oklahoma, um, they represent a unique chapter in American history. Nowhere else, neither in the deep south nor in the far west, did so many African-American men and women come together to create, occupy, and govern their own communities. Reports suggest that about 50 all black towns once existed in Oklahoma, a number unprecedented among the states, and some have been recognized with historical designation. Today, 30 plus locations are discernible in archival sources, but on the ground, only 14 all black towns remain as functioning governmental entities. All black towns are defined as towns that have black founders, black dominated governance structure, black town officials, or black postmaster. Uh, now I'll turn it over to Jenya Green to talk about the history of these towns. Jenya? Hi everyone. Um, as Corey said, I'm Jenya Green with Stantec, and I'm going to do my best to give you a brief overview of this really complicated and rich history. So our story starts during the period of U.S. westward expansion in the first half of the 19th century. At that time, what is now the state of Oklahoma was split into two territories, Indian Territory and Oklahoma Territory. Together, these territories were known as the Twin Territories. The first Black settlers in Indian Territory arrived in the 1830s and 1840s when the U.S. government forcibly relocated Native Americans from the U.S. Southeast along a route known as the Trail of Tears. Both free and enslaved Black people were part of these communities arriving to Indian Territory. After the Civil War, U.S. government treaties with groups including the Choctaw, Cherokee, Muscogee Creek, Seminole, and Chickasaw nations prohibited slavery in Indian Territory. Some of these nations authorized full citizenship to Black freedmen. Rights as citizens in many cases included land allotments for men, women, and children. In this way, many Black people of all ages achieved land ownership in Indian Territory decades before thousands of white settlers migrated westward. Meanwhile, the post-Civil War expansion of political freedoms for freed men and women of the South, a period known as Reconstruction, was curtailed in 1877 when the federal government withdrew troops from the South. The subsequent escalation of white violence against Black Americans and their communities across the South led many freed people to pursue the opportunity to establish all Black communities 
that would be free of racial violence and home to expanded economic, social, and civic opportunity. By 1881, Black leaders had formed organizations to promote the resettlement of Black communities in the Twin Territories. This foreshadowed a period when all Black towns were established at their greatest rate. Most all Black towns were founded during the period of territorial railroad expansion before Oklahoma achieved statehood. The majority of these formed in Indian Territory, where the early presence of landowning freedmen helped facilitate town formation. In the 1880s and 1890s, the expansion of railroads in the Twin Territories and the U.S. government acquisition of tribal land for settlement led both Black and white settler populations in the Twin Territories to explode. By 1890, the Twin Territories were home to 21,000 Black people, but by 1900, that number had more than doubled to 57,000. Railroads carried settlers into the territories and also made new newly developed communities economically viable by providing a means to ship agricultural products to distant markets. In some cases, entrepreneurial Black men and women capitalized on land purchases sited along new railroads and developed town plats along the rail lines. Once an all-Black town developed, what were its characteristics and how did it grow? One of the characteristics that all-Black towns share is their significance as planned places. In addition to creating town plats, <clears throat> Black town planners acted as promoters, advertising residential and commercial lots for sale through newspapers, sales agents deployed to southern states, and via kinship networks that spread word of the towns through word of mouth. Most all Black towns shared certain features and institutions. Um, among the most important was the United States Post Office. The Postal Service was the first and for a long time, the only federal agency that employed women and hired Black workers after the Civil War. They allowed for transfer of information and communication, as did locally owned and published newspapers, another feature of many towns. Most towns also featured a railroad depot and businesses including grocery stores, hotels, banks, barbershops, real estate agencies, and cafes. Some communities had a city hall and a jail, and many had fraternal organizations that provided outlets for socializing and political organization. Residents of all black towns placed a high value on education. Most towns had at least one primary school, including some built with money provided by the Rosenwald Fund. Several also had secondary, vocational, and higher education opportunities. These included the Oklahoma Colored Agricultural and Normal University, today known as Langston University in Langston, Oklahoma. Most all black towns had multiple churches. The high proportion of churches in the towns reflected the importance of religion to those who resided in them. But churches were more than just religious hubs. They also offered places to host secular gatherings and men and women's auxiliary groups. Each town also had a cemetery. In some cases, the burial ground is all that remains to mark the presence of the all black town. Dwellings to house residents are of course the most common property type in the all black towns. Those who lived in town were typically Southern migrant freedmen and their descendants. Most people associated with all black towns were dispersed on surrounding rural farmsteads who relied on the nearby town for governmental, commercial and institutional needs. This chart shows the kinds of institutions that were present in the thir in 13 of the 14 remaining all black towns at their peak. And this comes from um, the context that Corey and I helped to develop. <clears throat> the 20th century brought sweeping changes across the United States that affected all black towns. Most all black towns had been founded by the time Oklahoma achieved statehood in 1907. Despite lobbying by black leaders, the new Oklahoma legislature enshrined segregation in the law. Only a few new all black towns formed in the aftermath of statehood. Booker T formed in 1919 was probably the last all black town to be founded. Shortly thereafter, a number of major events led to the populations of American agricultural communities, including the all black towns to shrink. These events included the rise of urban manufacturing centers that attracted rural residents to move to cities for job opportunities, weather events and blight that killed crops, coupled with the decreased value of agricultural products after World War I, the economic consequences of the Dust Bowl and Great Depression, 
including the collapse of railroad companies that had connected all black towns and other agricultural areas to urban centers. Following World War II, the availability of urban manufacturing jobs only increased, leading to further decline in the population of the country's rural areas. In spite of the shrinking number of residents, some all black towns have continued to persist until today. Towns that survived had more diversified economies and were able to provide sufficient services to nearby residents. Most importantly, past and present residents of all black towns continue to value, maintain memories, and carry on the traditions associated with this, these uniquely American landscapes. Now I'll turn it back to Corey to talk a bit about our survey and what we found um, in the remaining all black towns. Thanks, Jenya. So um, the survey has been split into two phases and we'll start with phase one. Phase one included th these 13 all black towns. Um, and as noted, we were doing survey to evaluate the historic significance of the resources we surveyed and identify properties for potential nomination to the National Register of Historic Places or NRHP. And we'll just do a brief overview of the NRHP. So the NRHP is a federal list of historic resources deemed worthy of preservation for their historic significance. The list is administered by the National Park Service or NPS. And inclusion in the list is an honorary and administrative designation bestowed upon properties that meet registration criteria. In general, for a property to be deemed eligible for inclusion in the NRHP, must be at least 50 years old and must possess historic significance and integrity. Both individual properties and districts with a collection of resources can be listed in the NRHP. The NPS has established four criteria under which a property may be significant and a resource must possess significance under at least one criterion to be eligible for NRHP. Criterion A is properties associated with events that have made significant contributions to the broad patterns of our history. Criterion B is properties associated with the lives of persons significant to our past. Criterion C is properties that embody the distinctive characteristics of a type, period, or method of construction, or that represent the work of a master or possess high artistic values. These are things like architecture or engineering. Criterion D are properties that have yielded or may be likely to yield information important to prehistory or history. They must also retain integrity for a historic resource to be eligible for the NRHP, the integrity must also convey its significance. A resource need not possess all seven aspects of significance to retain integrity. The aspects are listed there. A combination of some or most may be sufficient. So broadly, these are our results. Um, we documented 226 resources in the first phase within the 13 towns. Um, of the 226, we recommended 40 to retain to be eligible because they retain sufficient integrity and convey their historic significance. Um, one of them, the Abe Lincoln Trading Store in Clearview, Oklahoma, we selected to nominate to the National Register and we drafted a form and was submitted to the NPS and recently listed. Um, here's another chart that identifies construction dates for the surveyed resources, assembling them by decade of construction. The highest percentage construct were constructed in the 1960s, followed by the 1940s, 50s, and then 30s. Um, note that these tables are available in our survey report that is on the Oklahoma Historical Society's website. Um, now we'll uh, take a look at the individual towns and highlight some of the resources that were recommended eligible in each town. So in Brooksville and Pottawatomie County, uh, we surveyed eight resources generally from 1910 to 1975. And you can see a map here uh, that shows the survey boundary that we used to survey within each town. Um, and this is St. John's Baptist Church in Brooksville uh, from around 1910, built by the congregation led by Reverend Judson White, formed in 1906. 
Then in Clearview, in Okwaski County, uh, we surveyed 18 resources ranging from 1920 to 1975. This is the boundary that we used. And here are a couple of eligible resources. On the left is the Clearview School, eligible under Criterion A for significance in the areas of Black ethnic heritage, community planning and development, and education. Um, also under Criterion C for significance in architecture as a representative and rare property type. The district boundary includes uh, this gymnasium and a sandstone wall. On the right is the Abe Lincoln Trading Post in Clearview that we nominated and was listed on the National Register. This was built in around 1903. Next is Grace in Okmulgee County. Uh, we surveyed 14 resources here, ranging from 1900 to 1975. Um, this is the Grayson Jail. It was previously determined eligible, um, and it may have been constructed near other government buildings like a town hall, although no other resources are extant in the area. Next is IXL in Okfuskie County. 23 resources were surveyed here from 1923 to 1973. Um, one we recommended eligible is this 1964 Pleasant Hill African Methodist Episcopal Church. Next is Langston in Logan County. Langston was only partially documented in phase one. The rest was documented in phase two, the current phase, which will be finished this year. In the first phase, we documented seven resources from around 1895 to 1975. This is the 1940s Scott's Grocery and Deli that we recommended eligible. Uh, next is Lima. In Seminole County, we documented 30 resources from 1907 to 1975. In Lima, there were multiple educational buildings, one of which is this Rosenwald School, Rosenwald Hall, built in 1921, that served as the elementary school for the community, and it was listed in 1984 on the National Register. In Redbird in Wagoner County, we documented 23 resources from 1930 to 1970 including the Redbird City Hall. Um, the Redbird City Hall was listed in 1984 as part of the historic local government buildings in Oklahoma's all black towns uh, under criterion A uh, for significance in the areas of black ethnic heritage and community planning and development. The boundary includes uh, the old Redbird Jail, which looks very similar to the one in Grayson that you saw earlier. In Rentiesville in McIntosh County, we documented 10 from 1910 to 1965, including this post office. In Summit, um, in Muskogee County, we documented 11 resource, resources from 1922 to 1970. Summit uh, was founded by L.W. Thomas. This is his house on the lower right-hand side that was listed in 2018. Above it is the St. Thomas Primitive Baptist Church, which was previously listed in 2004. In Taft, in Muskogee County, 12 resources were documented, dating from around 1910 to 1973. This town was also only partially surveyed in phase one. The rest was surveyed um, during our phase two of this project. Um, this is the Moton High School built in 1958 that currently houses the Taft City Hall.
next to Tatum's in Carter County, uh, where we documented 38 resources from 1910 to 1975. In Tatum's, we recommended eligible the Varner House and Grocery Store District um, under Criterion A uh, for significance in Black ethnic heritage, community planning and development, and commerce. You can see the 1945 grocery store, the 1955 associated dwelling is just to the left. Tullahassee and Wagoner County, we documented 20 resources from around 1912 to 1975. And here you can see the Carter G. Woodson School, which is eligible under Criterion A for significance in the areas of Black ethnic heritage, community planning and development, education. A 2012 fire destroyed most of this building, and it's a WPA era construction, but there's also a, this is a small district with a wood building that is nearby as well as a 1970s gymnasium. And in Vernon, in McIntosh County, 12 resources were documented from around 1910 to 1986. And we recommended eligible this dwelling from around 1910 that is a national folk style, single family dwelling. Those were all of the towns that we documented in the first phase. In the second phase, which is our current survey work, we conducted survey work in mid-October of 2023, and it included the rest of Langston, the rest of Taft, and um, the rem a remaining portion from Boley outside of the National Historic Landmark to reach a total of 500 resources documented as part of the Historic All Black Towns project. And as part of phase two, here's a snip from one of the maps we're working on the in Langston. We documented around 147 resources in this phase here. The red dots are historic age, meaning 50 years old at least. The green are younger than 50 years old. And the blue uh, are the ones we documented in the previous survey. In Taft, we documented approximately 85 resources. Uh, the same symbology applies here. And in Boley, we documented around 50 resources. Um, you can see the National Historic Landmark boundary included in the middle in pink. Um, so the current survey phase that we're in, it's in process. We're analyzing the survey data and preparing the survey forms, the HPRIs. Um, we will produce a report and an update to the historic context, expanding on um, this phase and the three towns that we focused on. We will also produce two nominations uh, for National Register of Historic Places, either from the previous 40 resources we recommended eligible or any that we identify in this phase. Um, and that has been everything. If you have any uh, questions or information about any of the resources or the towns that you'd like to share, please email myself or Jenya. Thank you. Thank you so much, Corey and Jenya. It's time for questions now. Linda Ozan will be reading those questions. All right, thank you again for your presentations. Um, the first question, is there a restoration project associated with the properties that you sh have shown in your presentation? The properties that we have shown, I'm not aware of any current restoration project, but I believe the second half of this presentation may have more information on current restoration activities. Another question asked is, what does IXL stand for? That is a good question. Um, 
I feel like that has not been fully ironed out. I don't think we have a full and from there are competing stories on that one. Um, that is an open question for history. I think we can officially say that of the three options, right? There is oh, the right. Indian exchange land, uh, perhaps that they stand for someone's initials or a couple people's initials, or that it is um, kind of what it sounds like, I excel, right? Um, to kind of be inspirational. But you're right, Corey, I don't think we have a good understanding of what it truly means. Um, let's see, we have a couple more questions. Did the state legislature impose designated, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm sorry, as I went to read it, it another question popped in and it disappeared. Okay, did the state legislature impose segregation to impose the idea that Oklahoma might be a black state? And they asked this question based on another presentation at the Oklahoma Historical Society that Oklahoma was suggested to be an all black state. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so during the territorial period in Oklahoma and during the period I talked about when um, Black leaders were thinking about, you know, where can Black communities be established to be, um, allow them to be safe um, and um, have economic opportunity, um, there were a couple of leaders that proposed the idea that Oklahoma should enter the union as a black state with um, black political leadership. And this was an idea that was discussed, um, but of course did not actually come to pass. So I don't, um, as far as I know, um, the Oklahoma state legislature imposing Jim Crow policies when Oklahoma did become a state was not necessarily a direct response to that, but was something that was just on the books in many states uh, in the union at the time. Okay, the next one is, uh, let me find one, here we go. Most of the structures nominated or designated are dilapidated. Are there any plans to fund our step in to secure these structures? So I guess basically they're asking, are there any plans to restore any of these buildings? Um. I'm unaware of any plans, but if they are nominated and or designated eligible, they are open to tax credits and uh, funding sources that were previously not open to them, which is a step forward. Will you be documenting resources in any of the non-occupied towns? Uh, we will not. It'll be just these 14 towns that were mentioned. As part of the grant funding. As, as part of the grant of, funding, yes, yes. Yeah. That's not to say that there won't be any other work that's done. Um, do you count the all black towns that were created after 1921 by those that fled the massacre? Um, Such as Buford Colony in South Haven. As far as this particular project, we have not. Um, that is a, another area for eventual survey and historical work for sure. Okay. Due to the towns being considered black historical landmarks, do you know if they would be considered for grants to restore infrastructure? Um, there are grants available for resources that are um, documented as part of the National Register, either determined eligible or listed, um, and that could be as part of a district or not. Um, they need to have that prior designation to be available for those types of funding. Um, as far as infrastructure goes, that's something that I, I don't think I can answer. Okay. Well, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna cut off the this round of questions and we're gonna let Gina uh, do the next presentation. And then we'll come back to any questions that we missed at the end.
Our second presenter today is Gina Shofala. Gina is the president and principal consultant for Shofala and Associates Inc., a project management and planning consulting firm start, that started in 1999. She had 40 years of engineering experience, specializing in project planning and construction, and added urban planning to her specialties in 2017. Today, Gina will be discussing her work in Tallahassee and how Tallahassee's past will bring vitality to its future. You're on mute, Gina. Okay. There you go. Okay. Thank you and uh, really glad for the opportunity to talk about uh, Tallahassee and the work that we've been doing in Tallahassee. Um, basically, my background as a project manager and planner bring more um, practical, I think, boots on the ground type of activities um, to uh, the work that we do and to the clients that we take on. So the presentation that I'm about to give you really will showcase really that type of, of uh, work. Uh, Tallahassee is located in Wagner County. Uh, it was incorporated in 1902 and platted in 1907. It um, currently right now is approximately 1.82 square miles. And some of it, it, it was reportedly a, a much larger town previously, but I think um, because over the years annexation um, lands that were possibly under the Tallahassee borders have now been annexed into Porter or into surrounding communities. Um, <clears throat> the oldest is the oldest black town of the original 51 or, and uh, certainly of the 13 uh, that are remaining. It, uh, the A.J. Mason building of all of the resources that are uh, eligible for nomination, the A.J. Mason building is uh, on the National Register. Uh, it was registered actually in... 1985, in August of 1985. Um, and then, um, as Corey had stated earlier, the Carter G. Woodson School, um, which I, I think is being considered now as part of the survey that they just did, it is actually under or is listed in the Oklahoma Landmarks Inventory uh, according to um, the Historical Society's uh, documentation. Um, its roots, Tallahassee's roots, stem back to uh, the 1850s that when the Tallahassee Mission Indian School was transferred to Creek Freedman, as was stated earlier, just a little bit of that history, I'm reiterating some of that. Um, <clears throat> at the time, I think, you know, the Creek Freedman population was beginning to dominate um, just the, uh, the area population, and so the Creek Nation or the Creek uh, uh, Council decided to transfer that school to the Creek Freedmen. Um, the, uh, and Corey's talked a, a lot about that fire of, of that school, but the Creek Council decided to uh, relocate most of their people and transfer that school to transfer to a different mission. And then they gave the school and to the community of Tallahassee and the Freedmen there. Uh, decline began really as a result, first, of the fallout from the Tulsa race riots, and then second, I think, just really the onset of the Great Depression. And then in 2023, uh, the population of Tallahassee is listed, or the mayor indicates that it's listed at 110 persons, which is actually up from the 2020 census, which indicated that there were 90 people in the town. Um, <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit about past and re recent town successes because by no means uh, have we stepped on the stage and really started or, or, you know, brought fire to what is going on. They have 
they are a town that has been working diligently and very hard uh, to rebuild. Mayor Keisha Curran, who I just uh, applaud as really the town's biggest champion, became mayor at in 2014. She uh, is a native of Tallahassee, loves her town, and um, when she took office, was really confronted with a lot of debt and 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 the threat of really losing their water system, which was the town's only source of income. So after uh, lots of court battles, et cetera, they, they were able to negotiate a payment plan and in 2018 started that repayment plan, paid it off in two years because they wanted to uh, uh, be very aggressive about it. And since then, the town has really been focused on what they need to do, the type of ordinances they need to put in place, who they need to partner with to start rebuilding their town. <clears throat> they, uh, there's an organization, nonprofit organization that was established called the Wildcat Foundation. They too are champions. They are a nonprofit that really has taken on some of the um, the revitalization of some of the resources that are there in town, specifically the John Ford Center. Um, and again, the town residents and just other partners. I mean, they have established relationships with banks, uh, with Wagner County, um, institutions, private, financial, and a nonprofit. That chart there is a list of just some of the successes that they've had. They have been awarded a $1 million ARPA, um, ARPA funds from the Oklahoma Water Resources Board, which is to help them with or actually engineer and install a new town water lines. Um, they've just recently received a REIT grant for $92,000 from the Eastern Oklahoma Development Um uh, district and that the Wildcat Foundations won that and that monies are being used right now. Uh, they are starting the uh, renovations to the John Ford uh, Community Center. And then uh, a few years ago, uh, the Institute of Quality Communities um, at out of the Christopher C. Gree Gibbs College of Architecture at the University of Oklahoma, did a community visioning session with them. And basically, um, uh, in, it was a process by which they wanted to get an idea, just begin to start thinking about their town, the vision for their town. But I think the, uh, the main focus of that was really to look at the John Ford Center and some of the other uh, assets that they had that they could turn into an economic engine or they could begin to think about uh, some of the, the activities that used to make Tallahassee uh, a great city or what, what were the assets that used to draw people from surrounding areas or other towns. And so that they, became, they were a great partner in helping them to just visualize and think through some of that. Uh, they've gone through city audits, which is a very difficult process, but uh, some of the, the, the uh, municipal activities, the financial audits that they have to go through are really to, again, to position them to start taking advantage of, of the resources that are available and partnering uh, with some of the other agencies to um, bring those resources to the town. OSU engineer has done an engineering study uh, and uh, design of the Carter G. Wilson uh, School. Uh, again, a lot of these studies, when they partner with, in, with institutions, those studies do not necessarily uh, get you any closer to actually restoring the school or restoring the assets, but they do uh, add some resources and some value in helping community rally around a particular vision. And then um, the town and the mayor became part of or a member of the more mayors on reparations and equity council. And I'm going to talk a little bit, I'm not going to talk in detail about it, but that's really 
uh, how we got involved, so Pilot Associates got involved with this town. Um, this map here on, on your uh, right was prepared by uh, IQC during their study, and it really shows Tallahassee, some of the key uh, points in Tallahassee. Um, again, we're going to focus primarily on the A.J. Mason building, uh, which you can see. I don't know how well you can see this, how large it is, but it is identified here as item number four. But I just want to bring attention to its proximity to Highway 51. And so the A.J. Mason and along and Lincoln Street, which Lincoln Street is considered their main street. Uh, from you access it from Highway 51, and the AJ Mason building literally is uh, just south of that, and it is really the gateway into uh, what what is their main town. Uh, our introduction to Tallahassee again, how we were invited. Uh, I was asked and invited to work with the mayor by sitting on an advisory board on reparations after she had joined the Moore uh, Council. That um, sitting on that board gave me an opportunity to get to know the mayor, get to know the town. Uh, but at the same time, I think the, the hope was that that council, because it was a national council of mayors, somehow, and because the topic was reparations, I think there was a hope and or a, 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 a thought that there would be resources uh, available for towns or for mayors who had identified certain projects that they wanted to undertake. And, and again, you know, when you're starting these uh, activities, you, you turn over every stone and try to figure out what's there and once you find out what's there you make a decision as to whether or not it's an effective use of your time um i think that uh, what we found out about the moore council was very informative but what we did find out was that <clears throat> the topic on re reparations in this council was really for each individual town each individual mayor to identify uh, with in collaboration with their town to identify what they thought reparations meant to them. And, and, and so for Tallahassee, reparations really translated into rebuilding their town. And so each town really had to put together a, a pilot project that and find the resources for those pilot projects and then those pilot projects would be submitted to uh, on a federal level, and and just you know, at top those topics would be analyzed as to what was effective, what was not effective, um, and I I guess the federal government or those uh, who would be reviewing the these pilot programs would then be able to determine what could actually be translated into na uh, national legislation or some, you know, some larger scale program. But that's how we got involved. Um, why getting involved with, with Tallahassee? Um, my passion uh, since, especially since uh, adding uh, city planning, city and regional planning to um my portfolio of, of services and my expertise, I and, and with some of the work that I've done in other communities, and, and specifically African American community in Oklahoma City, which is where I grew up, I just found that or felt as if Black towns um, did not have the technical resources. Uh, and the technical expertise at the table to help them navigate the waters of town planning, um, envisioning, and just finding these resources. Um, they were built at a time um, during uh, segregation, during often, I mean, some of them obviously prior to that, but uh, they were built because of the idea that there would be equity for them. 
um, we've grown up and things have gone on and, and developments have occurred around them and left them out. And so as we see the decline in many of those towns, we also see uh, a lack of institutional knowledge because they haven't been at the table. And so it was just important to me to uh, begin to offer uh, what I have learned uh, and my experience to um, you know, communities that, that may not have the, um, the breadth or the depth of knowledge that other communities have at their uh, disposal. Uh, having said that, though, and having and after being uh, working with the mayor on that Moore Council, we really decided that uh, the way Chauvelin Associates could be of help would really be to focus in on two areas. And one being we felt that if we could help them through a comprehensive planning process or a strategic planning process, then that would give them um, the tools to be able to implement projects incrementally. Um, and, and regardless of who was mayor, they would have something in place um, to move forward with. And then, you know, as project managers, we, we recognize that the uh, uh, rebuilding of one of the assets would be very critical. And the A.J. Mason building was really the asset that this mayor and the town wanted focus on. Um, our who has been, I can't, I would be remiss to, to not mention this because these projects are not easy. They're, there's never money with these projects. And so essentially, you know, when we start out working with uh, a town like this or a community, it's a passion project. And so we have to, you know, our, I've been, tried to build a culture of giving back and sowing seeds. And if this is one of the ways that we can do it, uh, we can. And we were fortunate enough to have an intern from uh, the University of Oklahoma's RCPL program who happened to just be the right fit. Um, again, because he was an intern, I could absorb that cost, um, but he also came to the table with the right attitude. Uh, he was gonna be put in a situation where he was gonna have to lead and he was going to have to go into uh, arenas without us actually watching over him. And he did a great job. So a lot of the work that you're going to see really was a result of us having the ability to put, to assign someone to Tallahassee to work directly with the mayor. And then my director of operations, Bob Levsky, who was really assigned to, for oversight for Kevin, especially when we got to working on the AJ Mason building, because, um, that was going to require an RFP process that was going to require us thinking through how to find resources to engage architects and engineers, you know, and so um, uh, Bob has just been instrumental. And now that Kevin has graduated and he's now working in Nashville, he's taken another job. Bob has sort of just picked up uh, and continued to work with the mayor and with Tallahassee. And then part of what we've done, too, is try to bring on other Expert, experts who know more than we know. And uh, so we brought on Larry Hopper, who's a former um, planner with, uh, uh, with Embark in Oklahoma City. So he brings a wealth of, of knowledge from his broad career. Uh, and then we just recently brought on a grant reviewer and uh, grant writer, uh, Claudette Roberts, to sort of help again help to uh, sharpen us in in grant writing and 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 help us be a little more successful in some of the pursuits that we've been endeavoring to take. Uh, the forerunners of this town, um, the AJ Mason Building, is named after Austin Mason. Um, he was considered the forerunner. Uh, or the really the former, uh, the foremost representative of 
the Black race in all of Wagner County. Uh, he was for many years the uh, head and front of all commercial and civic enterprises in Tallahassee. And um, it says in spite of his business connections, he found time to really give back and uh, foster both educational and religious movements in the town. I think it's, it's, um, it's noteworthy that this is a man who uh, I think Tallahassee sees as representing all that they hold dear. He not only built the A.J. Mason building in 1912, um, and his his he he was a, a mason by trade as well, but he saw the benefit of of advertising um, for African Americans to come and uh, purchase land, um, and uh, so he established a land office as well as. Uh, the post office was there, a general store was there. So the A.J. Mason building was really a, a, a hub of activity and the centerpiece of that community. So uh, again, we focused on two things, the comprehensive planning and the A.J. Mason building. Um, our goal originally, we started out really looking at how can we find resources to do comprehensive planning for a town this size or a smaller plan, a vision or a strategic plan. And what we found was that it was very difficult, or at least I was not or none of my staff was as knowledgeable about the resources that were available for this type of work. And so what we ended up doing is saying, let's 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 look at what the components of a comprehensive plan would be, and then let's try and find resources for those components. And perhaps we can uh, develop plans or, or work with the community to develop a vision under these various criteria. And then ultimately, when it's all said and done, you have all of the pieces for a strategic or a comprehensive plan uh, to be put in place. There is a difference between a strategic plan and a comprehensive plan. And so, again, I had mentioned earlier that the, with a town this size, it's, it, it, it's, you can weigh what's really more effective. Uh, I think at this stage of the game, it's there's a, a good argument to be made for just doing strategic planning, identifying some specific things that will really turn the town around or who could make a difference. And as the town is mobilized to um, get some of these projects done, uh, they attract more attention. They then, you know, as they are attracting new families coming in or families who were from here are retiring and coming back, it gives them an opportunity to, to begin to really um, then attract uh, developers or uh, potential, uh, um, you know, uh, manufacturer or, or some sort of, of create economic engines that will uh, uh, bring growth and add some some um, ability for the town to continue to thrive. Um, and when I talk about that, I, I'm really specifically, I know the town really feels very passionate about cultural tourism, educational tourism, and agritourism. And we think that they really have all of the components for that. And so when I turn this, you know, back to the future, We've, we've tried to identify some of the things that made Tallahassee important. You know, we found out that they used to have uh, peach orchards. And as we dug a little deeper, we found out that the, the, the peach orchards really belonged to one particular owner who as Tallahassee and, and his land was actually within the Tallahassee town boundaries. But as time went on, uh, Tallahassee declined. Um, he decided he wanted his land uh, uh, annexed into Porter. And so now you have the term you will hear Porter peaches versus Tallahassee peaches. And so some of these assets, you know, again, things happen over time. And so you, you, 
want to go down one trail and think that may be something that you can capitalize on and use to bring attention to the town only to find out that you know the the history of of what has happened has made that maybe not as as uh attractive of a, of a pursuit but they do still have the opportunity because of their agricultural background and um because of their desire to uh to uh, cultivate um uh, not peaches now but actually plums um so they 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 have some some citizens there who are growing plums and so there we've talked through some of these types of things and how they could be leveraged. Uh, the AJ Mason building, again, our focus. Um, the AJ Mason building is listed on the, the registry. Um, that makes it eligible for um, tax credits. But to be able to access tax credits, you have to fall within a particular category of developer, if you will the town really wanting to own and operate the A.J. Mason building, they are not, so essentially they would be acting as the developer. As an entity, they are not eligible for historic tax credits. So that 40% uh, of the, the uh, property basis or the basis of the project, they would not have that funding. So really what we found, and we talked to them about whether they would want to try and attract a developer who would develop it, uh, a, a private you know, commercial, it, it would have to be a commercial uh, um, for-profit person who was actually doing this, or it could be a nonprofit entity who's doing it, but Technically, the tax credits are going to be more associated with someone <coughs> who is a for-profit uh, entity. So because they wanted to own and operate this, that made them ineligible for that. So we really have to start thinking about grants. Gina, we're starting to get close to end of time, just to let you know. Okay. All right, sure. Uh, thanks for letting me know that. Uh, but we went through an RFP process with the A.J. Mason building. Uh, we engaged with the Methods Group. Uh, they were the low bidders on our RFP project process. But then we also had to then go back and negotiate with them because the grant really did not cover all of their expenses. Uh, so how do you get started? I love this quote. The way to get started is to quit talking and just begin doing it. And so that's where we're really practical. Let's hit the ground running. Um, here are what these are some of the items that are in play right now. We have applied for the African American Heritage Trust Fund. We did that last year. In, well, in 2022, we went out, we did the RFP, we engaged with the method group as a, an architect. We had enough money uh, via a grant from the National Trust Preservation Fund. We had enough money with that and in kind to be able to really pay for a conceptual design. But that conceptual design gave us the opportunity to establish the budgets for stabilization. We applied to the trust, we were denied, and we just reapplied in um, uh, February 1st of this year. So we're waiting for that. We uh, also have applied for the civil rights grant. We applied for the full restoration, which is over a little over 700,000. That would include the stabilization, that would include the build out. Um, and we're waiting for that. We haven't heard anything. Um, we just received an award from the Kirshner grant. Larry Hopper wrote that grant, um, called it the SPARK program. And it's basically to fund historical markers, banners, and repair, make some repairs to the Civic. We asked for 30,000, we were awarded 20. And so we will be executing that project or the town, the mayor and the town will be executing that project. We found out literally minutes ago that the INCOG REAP grant that we applied for um, was, uh, we were awarded 
uh, we were we applied for sixty thousand dollars to pay for the rest of the engineering and architecture. We still need DDs. We still need CDs. Um, and so we thought, and, and, and some of these grants are overlapping because we just didn't know what we're going to get. So we applied for multiple grants that may include some of the same thing. Um, the, the REAP grant only awarded 14,000. So we've got to put our heads together and figure out how we're going to, you know, come up with the rest of it to, uh, uh, engage with uh, the architects further. And then some of these smaller grants are some of the grants that we won or we were awarded from the National Trust or some aspect of it. And they have been awarded to help with education and marketing, if you will, or branding. And then some of the preservation planning, which will give us an opportunity to look at those assets that um, have been surveyed and um, work with the community to figure out what, you know, what they may think, what may be good uh, uh, uses for them. Uh, there are some other things in play. We were able to engage with the EPA. They provided technical assistance and provided uh, some environmental assessment, phase one environmental assessment uh, statements. Um, right now, the town is still working with the USDA. They have a grant and a loan pro uh, program for facilities. But, but the town has to do a income survey to be eligible for the grant. And so we're doing that right now. Uh, the Department of Commerce, we enrolled the town in the Main Street and that was so that we could also engage with EDA. And then we've talked to the mayor about sinking funds, bond, tips, some sort of understanding of what that might look like for a town of this size. But it, that would totally be a legal pursuit that she'd have to bring on board the right attorneys to help her through that process. Uh, the A.J. Mason building, these are the conceptuals that uh, came out of it. These were uh, provided by the method group. Uh, they did came out, did initial surveys of this space. And uh, based on the program, this is what, uh, th these are just the visuals. And so... Basically, like I said, the next steps would be to engage with them further for DDs and CDs um, uh, so that we could, we really need to be able to stabilize this building to uh, prevent further deterioration. Um, the town has found a roofing contractor who has agreed to at least donate a portion for the roof. And then there's acquisition of adjacent land that may be required infrastructure coordination is a huge one and then the full build out these are some of the assets that were identified in the survey and it's now knowledge i mean eligible for nomination and so we're hoping that some of that grant that we won this there's small grants and so we can't engage fully the way we would like to but we can create some sort of interactive platform or web-based platform where we can gain uh, input from community members as to what they might like to see happen with these buildings. Uh, in summary, you know, for projects like this, they're not easy. Again, there's never any money. Uh, often you are donating most of your time as an investment and hoping that, you know, eventually something will come out of it that is really significant, but it's it has to be a labor of love. Uh, we You have to have champions, committed community. You need partners, partners, partners. Um, you need expertise. You have to have an attitude of boots on the ground. And then finally, you need financial strategies and instruments and resources that you can use and that are viable or appropriate for the job. And that's all I have for you. Thank you. Um, there's my information. If anybody would like uh, to contact me or any additional information about uh, the project. Thank you so much, Gina. Uh, Linda, do we have any questions for Gina? So Gina, uh, one of the questions is, is it Creek Nation working with Tallahassee to help with the success of this town? No, they are not. Um, and, and it is a question that we ask the mayor and as of right now. I mean, her, she has attempted, um, but there was not really a, an interest. I think, again, time has gone on. There may have been, you know, she's, She's a fairly new mayor. Um, they they come out of a lot of challenges, and there's a possibility that 
we might be able to uh, uh, broaden that relationship. But it's certainly a relationship that I think is worth pursuing and turning that rock over again to see if they're, you know, if they may be interested in helping because they do have, you know, a united history here, if you will. Um, one of the other questions was, is there a way that you can provide a list of the different organizations that you mentioned that you were partnering with? And to that end, I mean, Gina, if you're willing, you can shoot me a list and I can provide it to the people who participated today. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Let's get that done. Um, that's really all the time we have for questions. There are a few more in here and we will provide those questions to the presenters and they can get back in touch with you to get you your answers if that's Okay, so Shay, back to you. Okay, since we're not going to be addressing any additional questions, we'll go ahead and bring this webinar to an end. We hope that everybody enjoyed our presentations on Oklahoma's All Black Towns today. Our next presentation in the Everyday Oklahoma Fascinating Stories and Familiar Places series is Rocks, Ruts, and Springs, Remnants of the Early Trails Through Oklahoma with Susan Dragoo. That will be on April 9th at 2 p.m. Central. Also, don't forget to check out our next Lunch and Learn about the Dr. W. H. Slaughterhouse in Oklahoma City. That presentation will be on February 13th at noon, and you can register now on the SHPO website. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.